studied the fact that God has created space in our lives for a day off, and he knows that, that we need time off. And the day off came out of the top ten. He thought it was so important that you work six and take one off, you put it into the top ten. Uh, Jesus came along, he fulfilled all the ten commandments, and he says, I am the Sabbath. So when you believe in him, he is the Sabbath, you still take one out of seven off. That's the deal. Last week we learned that our time is limited. In Psalm 90, verse number 12, that because time is limited, we have to live as if we're not going to be here tomorrow. And since our time is limited, we have to limit how we use our time. Too many times we just run wild with our time and we don't have time left for what we need to be spending our time on. Today, let's push that just a little bit further, and we're going to talk about our finances and how God views what we do with our money. Yes, there's a created space for our money. When we look at the two suitcases, one is jam-packed, overfilled, overstuffed, full of stuff, uh, and there can be no more room in it, and that's a model, it's a picture of many of your lives. That there's not created space for worship, there's not created space for your time to get things done that you needed to have done, and you're out of time, you're out of space. Now the other one, the clothes is folded, it's a little more neat, there's a little more room, and there's actually some margin there, there's some created space there. That's what this sermon series is about. If you have your Bible with you this morning, we'll go to Luke chapter 15, 11 through 17, and Luke 16 and 13. Two opposite texts, possibly. But in reality, these two texts are deeply connected. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 17. I'm not going to read the whole story of the prodigal son, just enough to get to where I want to be going with it. We know this story very well. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me, and he divided his property between them. So many times we hear a lot of teaching on the prodigal son, and we don't hear anything about the elder son, but the elder son received the same amount of inheritance that the younger one did. Right there it is. He divided it between them. Key point for today in verse number 13, not many days later, the inheritance was given and he stayed in the house. He stayed home for a while. Not many days later, but he stayed there for a while. The younger son gathered all he had and he took a journey into a far country and there he squandered his property. There's another key word if you want to circle that in your Bible. It does not say money. It says property. And this word in the original language means uh, a lot more than money. It means personal, self-worth, self-esteem. There's a lot more there. He squandered who he was in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. Verse number 15, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to keep pace. Longing to be fed with the pot, but the pig did. No one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants had more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? Let me point out that there's three people in this text three expressed people, and one implied. There's a father, there's a son one, and a son two. Those are the three expressed people. Who's the fourth person that is implied? The fourth person is in verse number 14, and when he has spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, he was in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. That's the fourth person. That's an implied person that has no name. And that's where we're going to hang out today. Many people never realize there's four people in this story. There's a doctrine that is going on here that directly affects what you do with your money. Let me explain this. The son wanted his inheritance. Evidently, dad was a wealthy man. So in order for him to receive his inheritance, his quality of life was going to change. He was a rich kid living at home, had everything he needed. And he went to dad to ask for an inheritance. So he wasn't gaining quality of life. He already had the good life. He already had everything that was dad was his, living at home. 
So he goes to that and he asks for an inheritance, and the loving dad divides it among the two brothers. Both of them got the inheritance at the same time. When I said be careful and notice that verse number 13, not many days, directly implies to us that there was a period after he received the inheritance, he stayed home. He didn't go anywhere. And I, I find that interesting because maybe some of you know somebody, or I do myself, people who have received an inheritance or have received a windfall for whatever reason from whoever makes no difference, and they don't change. It's the same person yesterday and today. They got $2 million, $5 million, $20 million, and the bank's still the same guy. That's the older brother here. He received his inheritance just like the younger brother did. But after a few days, after a period of time, verse number 13, the younger brother became what? Restless. The younger brother became anxious. He got his inheritance. And, hey, I can go do what I want. And in reality, that's what he wanted. He wanted to be in charge of his money. He wanted to do what he wanted, when he wanted, where he wanted. Anybody relate to that? Yeah. We do that. But the, the implied person here is the next level of teaching in this text. Because he's home, he's good, he's cool, he's hanging out with dad and his brother. Everything's okay. And all of a sudden, you know, I want a Mercedes. I want a convertible. I want my own life home. I want my stuff. I got the money to go do it. I'm going to go do it. Uh, see you later, dad and brother. I'm going to go do things my way. I'm out of here. Thank you for the money. See you later. Some people can inherit things in the kingdom, though. Why? Because of a restless spirit. Notice the key, the phrase, restless. What's this sermon series about? It's finding rest. So when you take a Sabbath off, there's rest. And when you find your time in your day off, you complete your rest. Jesus says in Hebrews chapter 11, you find your way into the rest. And now he has become restless. There's an anxiousness in him. He has to leave. There's a restless spirit. Now, let's just sit back for a moment and have a teaching. There's a name to the spirit. And it's called the doctrine of Balaam. That when you get restless, you, you become anxious. And, and you want to leave the Father's covering and you want to go out and do life your way. Let me read Balak is in the Old Testament book of Numbers. Balak is standing on the edge of his country on a mountain and he's overlooking the, the valley and here comes the children of Israel. They're so massive in size he knows full well that any military force, militant aggression towards them, he's going to fail. He cannot win this thing. So he goes to Balaam. Balak employs Balaam, and he says, Balaam, you're a, a witch or you're a sorcerer. You're, you're one that can put a hex on these people. You can stop this thing spiritually. Okay? So he employs Balaam, and God comes to Balaam and says, don't do it. But Balak tempts him, and he says, I'm going to give you gold. I'm going to give you silver. I'm going to brighten this thing up a little bit, and it's going to make it well worth your time to hex the children of Israel. Now, we know this part in Scripture because everybody knows the part of Scripture where the donkey talks to Balaam. Balaam is on his way to do this thing, and God intervenes and stops him, and the donkey lays down on him in the road. He beats the donkey three times, and, and all of a sudden the donkey turns to him and says, hey, how come you're beating me three times? And he's, whoa. And then his eyes are open, and he gets to see the angel. And the angel says, Has you, if you had gone any further, I'd have destroyed you, and that donkey laid down for a reason. So God intervenes with Balaam, and he sleeps that night, and he gets up the next morning, and guess what? He still goes, he still proceeds to do the hexing, to do the witchcraft, to do the sorcery. Now, God intervenes once again. And he says, you want to do this thing? Just go and try it. Balak says, go, go hex these people. And out of his mouth comes a what? A blessing. 
And he comes back, Balak gets mad. He says, what are you doing? I told you to curse these people. And you blessed them. I, I know, I had to try it. God's word came to me. This happens three times. He tries to curse them three times, and what's he do? He blesses them three times. The enemy knows how this doctrine of Balaam works. Balaam was called not to do it. He blesses them three times, and when you get to verse number 23 in Numbers, after they had blessed, after they were secured, what did the children of Israel do? They still press forward because the enemy knows if I can get you away from the Father, if I can get you out of the house, if I can get you out from under the covering, I can get at you. When the children of Israel hit Moab, they start to intervene with the people. Chapter 23 of Numbers says they're whoring around with the Moabites. They were protected, but as they went out and got in and started to do, do things their own way, they were exposed, and they were no longer protected, and they started to fall. God protected them as much as he could, but he says, if you want to get out here and do it your way, you're on your own. Now, who's the one that's pulling them out? Who's the one that says, come on? Come on, why don't you come out and play? Why don't you get over here a little ways? Now I can get at you. As long as you're under the blessing, I can't get at you. This is the doctrine of Balaam. Revelations 2, chapter 14, verse number 14. I know where you dwell. God talking to the church. Where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. This is God telling the church. I got a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam. Who hold the teaching that if I can get out on my own, do my own thing, I can be my own person. Some there hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. This is dangerous. And this is a teaching that comes out of the prodigal son. And it has to do with your finances. We live in a country that we have on our money in God we trust. We have in our pledge allegiance about God. We have been under the, the, the beautiful part of God, the beauty of his blessing, the beauty of his hand taking care of us, and, and it's all part of who we are in this nation. Now, let's take that down a little bit further. You live in a blessed country. You confess to believe in Jesus Christ. You are a blessed person. First thing you're going to say to me, okay, pastor, who, who is blessed? How do I know if, if I'm okay? How do I know if I'm underneath of this? Do you confess to believe in Jesus? You're blessed. You are in the house. You are in the fellowship. You are in the protection. You're there. Here's what we fail to understand, that when you're under the protection, when you're confessing, you come under the blood of Jesus, hell can't touch you. You just read that in the story. You just read it in Revelations, that when you confess to believe you're under the blood of Jesus, you wear the robe of righteousness, nothing can touch you. But if you start to move out and say, hey, I'm my own person, I'm my own guy, and you actually take the blessing that God has given you, and you go out and squander that blessing, and you're out in the world, that's the enemy saying, come on, let's do something else with what God has given you. Are you starting to see the picture? So we have a tendency to believe that your standard of living, your standard of living increases and your quality of life goes up. Listen to me loud and clear. That's a lie from the devil himself. Some of you have a higher standard of living right now in your life than you ever have had. But has your quality of life come up, came up? Some of you may, may be enjoying more income than you've ever had, but it does not mean that your quality of life has come up. And that's the tension we live in. That, that's the, that's the, the false lie that the devil wants us to 
feed into, he says, well, if you can make a little more money, if you can have a little better job, you can get your standard up here, your quality of life will increase. That's not true. In fact, as Christians, we totally come against that because we know that our quality of life is based completely on the person of Jesus the Christ, not in the stuff that we have and the standard of living that we think we need to have. Hence, the prodigal son thought that if he got the stuff, his standard would come up and his quality would come up because he could go do his deal. Not quite yet to these, Richard, just back up to the... You'll confuse my audience. Back up another one. There you go. Leave her right there. Thank you. Are you seeing the picture? We have a tendency to believe that if the standard increases, the quality will. It's not true. Back to the prodigal son. He thought if he could get the money, his quality of life would increase. Listen, your cars, your homes, your shoes... Your boat, your farm, your tractors, all the stuff are symptoms of the blessing. They're symptoms of the blessing that God has given to you. Blessed means it's in the invisible state of being where the favor of God is on your life. Blessed means the invisible state of being where the favor of God is on your life. This, this story that Carrie just read to us is phenomenal. I mean, this guy lost just about everything except for his spouse. And he pens the words of this song, it's well with my soul. You can be blessed and nothing can be going on in your life. A lot of times we say happy, happy, I'm, I'm really happy. And there's nothing wrong with the word happy, but I don't necessarily like the word happy because it's from the Latin and happen is where we get the root word. And happen means that you will be happy because something happened to you. Did you catch that? You can be blessed without anything happening to you. And that's the key. The prodigal son was living in the house. He had it all. Nothing had to happen to him. He didn't have to take the money for his quality of his standard of his life to go up. So you can, you can settle in without having to take and to go and do. It's the doctrine of Balaam. And the beautiful thing of it is, it says no weapon formed against me is going to hurt me. So I don't have to go out there and do my thing. He's still tracking with me. Because I want to make sure that you understand the doctrine of Balaam is at work in our country. And it is so scary. That's when we get to Luke chapter 16, verse 13, and Jesus says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. How do you know if this doctrine is at work in your life? I said if you're a confessing believer, you're under the blessed, you're under the grace, can you move out of the will of God? Yes, you can. God gives you full authority to make a choice. You've got the sovereign will of God and the command will of God. The command will of God, you can go completely against and do whatever you want to do. The prodigal son received his inheritance. He lived at home for a while. He got a restless spirit. And what did he do? He moved out. Now the fourth person that's implied in this text is the devil. He attached himself to a person in a faraway country when the famine came because he was in need, and he attached himself to a citizen of that country. We're talking about rest. We're talking about time, created space. Here's what the devil will do to you. Hey, you made a little extra money last year. You got a $15,000 bonus. Why don't you go and buy yourself a boat so you can spend some quality time with your family? Sounds good to me. I can pay cash for it. See what he's doing? Come on. Because if, this is the devil, if I can get you out from under the house, if I can get you out of the what? The fellowship. If I can pull you away, if I can put a carrot in front of your face, dangle, get you out here, now I can get at you. But if you're over here in the fellowship and you're in the house, I can't touch you. And then comes Saturday night, we paid $15,000 for a boat last month and we haven't even used it yet. Let's go to the lake tomorrow. What's tomorrow? It's your Sabbath day off. 
Remember I said two weeks ago that you can work six days and take one off. We can work five days in this country, a 40-hour week, and think we get two days off, and everybody in this country practically is working seven days a week because they don't take a day off, even though they're being enticed because they're going out and playing where the devil is tempting you out. Now, I'm not picking on anybody with a boat. I want you to hear that loud and clear. I have had boats, and we've played a lot with boats. This is his system. Hey, if I can get you to buy that house, and I can get you in debt just a little bit, brother, and the basement needs to be repaired, come on, come on. I'm just going to lure you over here a little bit. And then now you've got to work the overtime, so you're working Saturday. Oh, the kids' basement isn't remodeled yet in the basement, and I've got to get that done. So when does it happen? It happens on your day off. See how he entices? And this is what he does to us. Is he, if, if I can just, come on, come on. I'm serious, folks. This is how he works. This is the doctrine of Balaam. Because Balaam tried to curse, he blessed, and the children were okay until they got over there to Moab, and now they went and did their thing. He will pull in all sorts of ways. And he just keeps saying, come on. Come on. I know you've seen me do this, but I'm going to keep doing it this morning a lot because that's how he works. Come on. If I can get you to spend a little bit of money over here, and now you're going to have to work the second job. If I can get you out of that fellowship, if I can get you out from underneath that covering, now I got you. And it got so bad that he got hungry, and he was in need. And there's a whole sermon series on the little phrase, he came to himself. Numbers 22, 12, these people were blessed. And you stay in the presence of God, you stay in the will of God. Nothing can touch you. So all you got to do this morning is say, hey, devil, I changed my mind. You're here today, you're hearing the word of God, you've changed your mind, you're willing to stay in the house, you're willing to stay under the blessing of God and say, hey, turn to somebody and say that today. Devil, I've changed my mind. Some of you have. <laughs> Listen, there is power in voicing that. You need to get used to doing that. None of you have ever done that before. Okay, let's do it again. Let's stay here today until everybody does it. Might go home at 6 o'clock tonight. <laughs> Devil, I've changed my mind. Devil, I've changed my mind. All right, now you're all looking at me. Look at the person sitting next to you and say, Devil, I've changed my mind. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Something just happened, though. Something just happened in the spiritual world. Guess who heard that? The enemy heard that. That's why you've got to get used to saying things out loud. When, when you start to realize, I've been tempted, I've been pulled away, I'm coming back, hey, enemy, the war's over. Jesus has died for my sins. I've changed my mind. I'm not playing your game anymore. And you got to say that. Speak that into your life. Now, the property is key here. Because so many times people will say, okay, well, he changed his mind. He went and squandered everything. But it's property. It's not money. So when you fall under the doctrine of Balaam and he pulls you out and he lures you away, you don't only lose your money. You lose your self-esteem. You lose your, your mental capacity to think that you're a good person because he's just going to pull you down, pull you down, pull you down. You lose all of it. You lose who you are. And that takes us to the part two of the Balaam doctrine. There's a B clause that I've already explained to you. Is you have to be so aware of this process. You see, he was okay in the house, but when he moved out is when he got in trouble. The B clause of the Balaam doctrine, number one, is that the enticing, just say no. Hey, I'm not buying the boat. I'm not buying the camper. But listen, I, I don't want you to get confused here because God wants to bless you. God wants you to have the car. God wants you to have the boat. God wants you to have the camper. God wants you to enjoy that time with your family however you do it. He wants that for you. That's John 10.10, 10, the abundant life. But you don't take that then and let the enemy pull it away and whatever God thought for good, he's going to use for bad. Is that clear? 
I don't want you going away thinking that I got to go home and sell everything. That's what Pastor Lynn said because I'm being. No. If it's causing you to be pulled away, now you got to look at it. But if it's a blessing from God and you're using it in the right way, God wants you to have it all. B doctrine. Stay in the house. Stay in the fellowship. Stay in the word. Stay in the relationship. No matter how much it come on, no matter how much he says it, say no. Now here's the problem with the two suitcases when your life is so crammed, so full, so, so packed, you can't even think when he comes along, guess what looks pretty good? The devil looks pretty good. Because he's going to package it in such a way that if I can get you out, you can get a little time off, you can get the boat, buy the condo in Florida, whatever it is, because you're so busy. This whole series, this whole message is about that created space in the suitcase that the flo flows, flows is folded nicely. The clothes is folded nicely. It's okay for your life to look like that. Some people can function in that. But you cannot have your spiritual life looking like that. There is no room for that. The B doctrine is the fact that you stay in the house. People do not realize how powerful this fellowship is. People do not realize that when you miss this, you may have missed the most important thing that could ever happen to you 12 months to two years because you missed one Sunday. But that's because the enemy has pulled you out. So, Pastor Lynn, how in the world does this relate to making sense in our finances? Let's go back to the standard of living and the quality of life. The prodigal son inherited the money, and he thought that if his standard of living would go up, his quality of life would go up, and that's a lie. Many people in this country have fallen into that same lie. Better job, everything's going to be better, and I'm going to have a better quality of life. A lot of times it's the reverse. We're working harder, we're putting in more hours, we're exchanging hours for dollars, there's not enough hours in the week to get my bills paid, and the quality of life deteriorates. So let me ask you this question. If you could have the mansion on the hill and the new car and the garage and the most awesome toys and stuff and that everything looks like, but your marriage would be crap, which one would you want? And that's what we've done. We've, we've given up one for the other. And we think that we're going to have an awesome quality life, and it's not true. That's because the enemy has pulled you away. Do you think God knows your needs? Yes, he does. You confess to believe a child of God. You confess to believe in Jesus. You've come under the blood of Jesus. God wants to care for you. Do you think he knows those needs? Yes. Here's what we're doing. We've exchanged, we've exchanged debt for discipline in the United States. You see, time is limited. Money's not. Because if you want it, you can go get it. And if you want it, you can go borrow it. Dad, I want my inheritance. I want what I want, and I'm going to go get it, and I'm going to go do it. See the connection? That's the doctrine of Balaam. Time is limited, but money's not because you can borrow money, and we would rather borrow money than be disciplined by the Word of God to say, no, we shouldn't be doing that. In America today, we have... Now you can jump there, thanks. We have not lived by this standard. Years of employment, annual dollars. So fortunately for us in a blessed country, the longer you work, the more dollars you make. It's a pretty safe guess anymore in America. So you can see there on the left-hand side of the screen that the longer you work, the more money you make, and, and there, the dollars go up, and there should be a created space in between what you make and what you spend, right? Everybody say amen, that, that should happen? Now, that space is a percentage of your income. How many of you know it? How many of you know the, the created space in between those two? You should be able to sit down at any given time and say, hey, pastor, 15% of my income is in between my expenses. I got 15% margin. 
I got space to do with whatever I want to do. If you don't know that number, you don't know where your money's going. Prodigal son went to dad and said, hey, just give it to me. I'm going to go live the way I want to live. And look at the next slide. Here's what happens. This is America today. That they're actually together, and I didn't put in the third slide because I didn't want everybody to go home depressed, but up until a couple years ago, expenses increased over income. People were spending more than they were taking in, basing it solely on the fact of appreciation. That if I bought my house, it's going to appreciate. I can borrow against it because in five years it's going to be worth this anyway. I didn't even put that up there for you. But if, if you're living here, income expense, same line, what comes in, what goes out. There's no space. There's no space. This is when the famine hit and he became desperate and he's attached to the doctrine of Balaam and he's severe and he wants to go eat with the pigs because of this slide right here. Income expense go to the same level. That's a tight squeeze. That's a tight squeeze. Luke chapter 16, verse 13. No one can serve two masters, for he'll either hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Listen, if you're not a Christian and you're sitting here today, and there might be somebody here like that, this is just really good information. It's, it's good practical stuff. You can go home and take it, put it to use. But if you're a Christian today, you believe God's word to be the truth, this is a mandate. You don't have an option. Because God makes it very clear. He says you can't serve both. It ain't going to happen. You cannot do it. Banks don't want to be your master. You hate them and you don't know who they are. You ever think about that? They want to help you. They, they want to get you into your home. They want to help you have a better life. They want to do things. Your, but don't make it your master. Here's what we've done. We've spent our way into slavery. And it all goes back to, back to the story of the prodigal son. He took everything he had, Dr. Nabalem pulled him away, went and lived like he wanted. He spent his way into slavery. And now he's working for a guy feeding the pigs out in the field. There's no left created space in his life. And if you're sitting here today and, and this is hitting you, that's okay. God is a God of grace. God is a God of love. He says, I'm going to help you through this. You're starting to see the light bulb. We're going to come out the other side. The story we're here during offering, the guy lost it all. And you don't know until you're in a time of adversity how deep this thing really is. So if you're in a time of adversity right now and you're looking at these slides and you're thinking, oh, no, and the pastor just said, if I'm a Christian, hey, I'm, no. God is a God of grace. God is a God of love. And he says, you start to see it my way, and you come back to the house, you come back to the fellowship, I'm going to take care of you. And I'm going to make sure it's okay. It is a big deal for us. Look at Matthew 6.34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will not be anxious about anything. Sufficient for the day in its own trouble. Matthew 6.33 is the verse where seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So what's the order? What's the process? Stay in the house. Don't let the restless spirit get you. Look at the next slide. This is where we learn to live. It's not that difficult. You got a little income. You got a little expense. You got space. And you know what I found is when you teach this correctly like Dave Ramsey does, all I'm doing is taking information out of Dave Ramsey's book today. I didn't come up with any of this stuff. Dave teaches this over and over. Jim Guy teaches it in our congregation. But when you have the created space, guess what? You're full of joy of the Lord. You can come into worship and you can actually worship. You know how many people come into worship and this is what they're thinking about? And then when the offering plate comes by that looks like there's a rattlesnake in there, <laughs> Get that out of here. I don't have enough money in my account anyway. That's what's in your head. It's because there's no space. But when you live in biblical principles, you'll always have more than enough. And when you don't get, come on, when you don't get sucked into the doctrine of Balaam, where he can get you out from underneath the blessing, you actually can breathe. And you get to have a life, and you get to live. And then you can go to the Lord in prayer. When you go to the Lord in prayer, what's the first thing you're going to pray about? 
is the one thing that's bothering you. And it's over and over and over. And if this is bothering you today, God's hearing your prayer. And he says, listen, you're sitting in the fellowship today. You're hearing something you need to hear. So let's go home and do something about it. You're smart people. You wouldn't be here today if you weren't. You're intelligent people by design. You confess to believe in Jesus the Christ. You know that his word is true. So I'm just going to leave you with some steps. I'm going to leave you with some things to implement. First one is just decide to do this. Decide to do it. Do I have to sit here and talk to you about a half an hour for this to persuade you to do that? No, I don't have to do that because of what I just said to you. You know the story of the prodigal son. I've taught you the Balaam doctrine. The, the fact that if you're being enticed and you're being pulled away, you're starting to succumb to the lies of the enemy. And we all said it out loud today, what? Devil, I've changed my mind. I'm not going back to those ways. So today, you can say, I decide to do this. I ain't going to force you to say that out loud. If you want to say it out loud with me, let's do it. Hey, I decide to do this. Some did. There it is right there. The rest of these have fallen into place. You have to make a conscious decision to say that I confess to believe in Jesus Christ. I've received my inheritance. Listen, what was his is yours. I've adopted you into the family. I've grafted you into the plant. What was mine is now yours. So everything on this side of glory is ours. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's yours. Do you believe that? Yeah. Psalm 23, when David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's part of this doctrine. Because shadow has no power. Does it? No. You, you've been born again, you're saved. The enemy has no power. Later on in that psalm, he says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemy. You starting to see it? Go ahead and prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemy. Why? Because I'm in the house. He can't touch me. Decide to do it. Number two, set up your created space of percentage. Go home and do whatever it takes and figure out how much created space you have. If you don't know that created space, you don't know it. And you may not even know that you don't have any. Some people have an income level that their percentage in between there is 95%. Now that, that's awesome. That's being blessed. That's huge. There's people like that in this country. There's people like that in this town. Maybe some of you sitting here. That only 5% of your income is expenses. You know what you can do with the rest? It's between you and the Lord. Know your created space. Know that percentage of in between, the income and the expense. Number three, spy on your money for two months. This is tough. I've been trying to do this all year. I didn't want to get to this point in the sermon and say, hey, I, I just, I'm doing it. I'm not doing it all. You, you know a sermon speaks to the preacher before he can preach it? You've got to implement some of these things. Spy on your money for two months. Know where your money's going. The only way you're going to know your margin is you've got to know where it's going. Where did the prodigal son money, money's go? There, I did it, didn't I? I've been accused of doing that too much. You've got to know where it's going. He squandered it. It just went. He got out from underneath the blessing. Balaam and doctrine got him. Come on, let's go play. Get rid of it all. Then I got you, and we can all go to hell and be happy. That's what he says. Spy on your money for two months. Number four, cut your spending. Cut your spending. The only way you're going to come up with a created margin is you've got to know where it's going, and you've got to stop the spending. And number five, reduce your debt. We would rather have debt than discipline. I'm guilty. I've lived many years of my life where I'd rather have debt than discipline. And I often said that, and this is a confession. Talk about being in the house and being blessed. I often said that I can be in debt because I always can make enough money to pay for the debt. God had always blessed us that way. So if I got a little debt over here, so what? I'll make enough next year, it'll be covered. That's part of the Balaam doctrine. 
That's part of the luring you out. So you're sitting here today and you're saying, Pastor Lynn, how do I reduce my debt? Guess what? There's a little book here called Dave Ramsey, and I, I'm getting a cut out of, for Dave today. No, I'm not. Financial Peace Revisited, okay? This book is where two-thirds of this sermon came from. He doesn't do the whole prodigal son thing because God gave me that on how these two intervened in the Balaam doctrine. But if you go to page 67, I got a little marker there, dumping debt, and why am I hanging out on this for number five is because this is the most crucial area in the United States today. Two, three credit cards maxed. People have debt. How do I get rid of debt? Page 67, chapter number eight. Go to, the, go to Barnes & Noble, pick this book up. Ask Jim Guy, he maybe has two or three on hand, and start to work on it today. Now, if we're talking about debt and you're saying, I don't have enough money to buy the book. I can't even afford the book. Here, take this one. My name's not in it, but you can have it. Ask Jim. Take it. Use it. If it changes your life, it's worth it. And if you're not comfortable with that, this book is going to be over here on the back table, chapter 8, dumping debt, verse number 67, and all of you have smartphones, and you take pictures of anything and everything in the world, go back there with your smartphone and take a picture of every page, and then you can go home and read it. That went over really good. You can do that. I'm okay with that. And then when you get it all figured out and you get your debt settled, then you can go to Barnes & Noble and buy your own copy and give it away to somebody else. If you're a Jesus follower, it's a mandate. I taught you the doctrine, doctrine of Balaam today. God doesn't want any of you to live there. God doesn't want any of us to be there. And you have to learn and understand how the enemy operates, how he will seduce, how he wants to pull you away. But God wants you to have space. That's all we're saying today. Jesus came so that you didn't have to be here, that you can be a born-again believer and you can come over here and he created the space that you can be in the relationship with God the Father and he said, I so loved you that I have secured all of this for you. And we don't have to listen to the lies. We don't have to listen to the world. We don't have to listen to any of that. Stay in the fellowship. Stay in the house. Stay confessing, believing in Jesus, and you will have the John 10.10 10 life, which simply says, the thief came to kill, steal, and destroy, but I came that you may have life, and that you may have life abundantly. And the word there, abundantly, we can't translate. Do you know that? We can't translate the word abundantly because it is so much. Spiritually and physically. Amen. Did they beat you up today? No. Nah. Good one. All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your word, and your word is our roadmap. Your word is our guide. Your word is our tool. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the sanctification process in the word. And Father, I pray for the people hit, sitting here today that this really hit them. And I pray that they go home and they wrestle with you. And if the enemy has, has pulled them out and lured them away, Father, in your grace and your mercy, like the, like the son that went and did his thing, that we can come to you. And we can return home and we can be welcomed with open arms. And we can receive everything that you have, and it's for us. Father, we thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for the fact that you constantly extend that grace and that mercy and that love, and that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And we ask for forgiveness from coming out of the house. So let us find our way into your place, into your peace, into your joy, and we can bask in the abundant life and say thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray.